Well, hello and welcome everybody to the next in the uh, series of Petroc Talks. Uh, my name's Sean Mackney. I'm principal at Petroc and I'm going to be uh, chairing uh, this uh, really interesting session that we've got for us today. Uh, Petroc Talks is our series of thought leaders addressing the major topics of the day. And, and we have a, a really interesting uh, session uh, for us all uh, uh, ahead of us. Um, for Petroc, we are committed to addressing the issues that matter to our community, um, both thinking about the skills and the education needs, uh, but also looking at how we can work together with other partners to address the shared priorities um, for life in Northern Devon. Um, I said we have a really uh, another really exciting session uh, for you today um, where we're here in an area of outstanding natural beauty with um, moors, sea, flora and fauna around us um, in a UNESCO biosphere. Um, the topic for today is is really important and um, particularly with us following close um, on the COP26 uh, uh, discussions. So our topic for today is biodiversity. What is the role of our national parks and reserves in protecting our natural environment now and into the future? And I have four great speakers uh, for us uh, coming up and they'll speak in this order. Uh, the first is uh, Chief Executive um, of the uh, North Devon Biosphere, Andy Bell. Uh, our second speaker, um, Wildlife Conservation Officer at the Exmoor National Park Authority, um, Ali Hawkins. Um, our third speaker, um, Chief Executive of Plastics Free North uh, Devon, Claire Moody. And uh, last but certainly not least, um, our own Jenny Challenger, uh, the uh, Programme Manager for our new Foundation Degree Programme in Sustainable uh, Environmental Management. I'm going to um, uh, invite each of the speakers to um, make some introductory remarks for five to ten minutes. A number of them may have some slides. Um, then we will open it up for questions. Um, do feel free as you um, as questions occur to you to um, write those up in the comments and chat. All of the speakers will be able to see them, and then we'll get into the discussion um, that will follow our speakers. So, um, without further ado, um, over to Andy. Andy. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, what I want to do is just um, introduce um, my job and my role, and particularly for the, reintroduce the, the North Devon Biosphere. So if I could just share the, uh, the screen. I'll be with you in a sec. Okay. So there we go. So it's just to remind or sometimes surprise everybody by the size of the designation. So a lot of people think of um, the, the North Devon Biosphere Reserve as being just Braunton Burrows there in the in the kind of middle of that area. But in fact, the, the designation is, is what we call an ecosystem based designation. So it's not one that follows just a particular site because somebody owns it or it's being designated. It's this one actually sort of follows an ecosystem. So what we have is the, the catchment or the, all the land that drains down to the North Devon coast. So you can see me tracing the arrow around. So that from top of Exmoor and top of Dartmoor and everything down to the coast. And then we go way beyond Lundy by about 12 miles and back in. And unfortunately, because there are rules about different things in Wales and England, we have to follow a national boundary here down the midline of that channel. But, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things we have to live with. Um, and just another kind of slightly interesting point is that we originally defined the boundary following a, a, a level of depth or bathymetry around Lundy and then back into the coast here. And then we would talk to our fishermen, um, so sort of while we were doing the designation and a little bit afterwards, they said, well, you know, if you went out to the 12 nautical miles, you would actually cover the land or the, or the grounds, the fishing grounds that they fish. And he said, you know, we feel as though we're part of the ecosystem, so therefore, if you took it out to the 12 mile limit, we would like to see that work because what we'd like to do is say, we can catch our fish sustainably in a biosphere reserve and add value to their fish. 
So it, it presented some kind of interesting idea that we'd actually sort of go to a geographic boundary or a legal boundary as defined by the, uh, the fishermen there. So um, the other thing about biosphere reserves as well is that they, we are a network, a global network of about 720 sites uh, around the world. So, <clears throat> so North Devon, all the residents of North Devon, you're in this special club um, where we sort of linked up with. So we just link. You're going to be sound coming in there. That's it. That's it sorted. Um, so we linked up with all these other sites around the world. So it includes sort of uh, Hawaii, for example. Um, we've got the Serengeti and Gorongoro crater in Tanz um, Tanzania. And, you know, something like the, the Great Barrier Reef that's headed over down in um, in Australia. So North Devon is really a special place. We are sitting amongst the giants and these kind of things. So I'll just stop sharing then, just come back to talking to you normally. Um, so my role is I helped set up the, the UNESCO Bice Reserve in the first place. And my job near now is to try and coordinate all the things that happen within it. And it is a coordination. It's not a kind of an absolute management bit because what we have is 34 organizations that make up the partnership. That's the local authorities. It's the national agencies, et cetera, and, what, um, and all the, the NGOs, et cetera, that work together and community groups and individuals and research institutions that make up the whole um, partnership of the Biosphere Reserve. And from that, we have to do conservation. We have to do sustainable development. And we have to do this knowledge generation, knowledge sharing, which is the research and dissemination part, but also sort of looking at education in the round. So when it comes down to conservation, I mean, it, it is a really exciting time at the minute. Um, exciting and scary because we are you know, literally on the edge of that sort of next great extinction. And, you know, there's evidence all around us for that. So it is it is quite a scary time to be around and see this happen. And it's, you know, we don't want it to happen on our watch by any means. So what we're trying to see here is, you know, we've shown over the last 20 years since the, the reserve was designated that we've actually slowed that decline in North Devon, but that decline is still happening. So we need to make sure that we can we can um, do something about that and really sort of turn that corner around because the idea of biosphere reserves, they're to, supposed to be examples to the rest of the world of how it can be done. And that's really what we're trying to do. So there's all sorts of exciting possibilities in terms of the, um, the kind of activities that we do. Um, and the, the ways that we approach some of these things. So the, the latest one uh, that came from government is the natural capital approach. So how do you have things like biodiversity and what it does for you, um, what it does for society? And that whole argument really came out of there about um, how to put a value on things so that the Treasury, UK Treasury and financial institutions can actually then see value in them. So you're trying to talk in terms of language that those financial institutions can understand so they can then say okay yes it is worth this therefore we can start investing literally investing in the recovery of nature because of the benefits it gives us so for that we're looking at uh, the problems of climate change and biodiversity loss etc but also what we're seeing is the the idea of nature-based solutions to address some of those problems we have and as we saw during lockdown one of those nature-based solutions is health and well-being mental health and well-being People got outside to actually sort of, and they actually felt better for it. And that was really documented. It was really evident. And that's one of the most obvious benefits. But the other things as well, we do in terms of um, using natural systems to reduce flooding. So we've done work in the estuary on terms of dune management, salt marsh creation, but also higher up in the catchment where we've re restored wetlands. We've also um, done a lot of tree planting as well to reduce the, that flooding impact. And then at the same time is improving water quality. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that's come out there, a lot of energy behind all this and getting the proof and the evidence behind it so you can say, well, it's actually money well spent coming back in there. So all the time having to prove that back to um, to government. So with the benefits of all these new ideas, activities, and who benefits? Well, it's everyone. There was a, a government review of the value of biodiversity done by P Professor Das Gupta. In the Das Gupta review, he said, you know, biodiversity benefits everybody. You cannot... You know, life would not exist for humans if it wasn't for biodiversity. Therefore, we need to actually take care. We need to take care of um, how we measure these things as well. G uh, gross domestic product is not a real means of how an economy works. We need to look at what is the value of our natural systems, what they bring to us, 
make sure they're in good health and make sure we can keep on tracking that that uh, that health as it goes along. Otherwise, if it's an unhealthy system, it won't do us all those benefits and we go down in terms of our well-being. So in terms of looking at uh, the challenges that we've got to bring, so it's, it's trying to get that investment back in. Um, so one of the international targets for uh, protecting biodiversity is 30% by 30. The government at the moment is trying to see how we can meet that review using the likes of national parks, AONBs. We're, we're still talking to the government about how they can use biosphere reserves to help move that towards that 30% target. But quite honestly, when you look at the investment that has been in protected areas in the past, it hasn't really delivered because it's been underinvested. A lot of the marine sites, are, you know, we've got them sort of lines drawn on the map, but there is no activity in there that's really supporting conservation. We have a lot of areas, you know, that are classically protected areas that may be protected for other reasons, like landscape and an AOMB. It's not really addressing biodiversity. Therefore, we have, you know, triple SIs inside AOMBs and other protected landscapes that are not in good condition, primarily because it hasn't been their job to, to invest in that. Government has actually sort of really delivered that. So even sort of drawing maps and sort of producing 30% of the area covered by protected areas is not the job. That's not the end job. The end job is actually the biodiversity being improved within those areas to help that sort of be the reservoir for meeting the rest of the area. And that's really where the, you know, the, the, the biosphere reserve comes in because, you know, we're sitting there between Dartmoor or Exmoor and the AUNB and, you know, we're filling the white space in between as well and trying to make that work because in some ways, it's been that um, the antidote to protected areas where it works that little bit in between, trying to get that um, that work together with, with uh, cooperation rather than enforcement. And it works. You know, we've, we've got the evidence that we can do that. So hence that discussion with government about saying, as a biased reserve, it's not a protected area. It's got protected areas within it, but all that white space in between. We've also delivered these benefits, but we want to make sure we can prove those benefits. We just don't want to be another line on the map that says, the government's ticked the box for 30% because that's not going to do anybody any service by just sort of ticking a box. We've got to make sure that the goods are there and delivered. So, I mean, our vision for the future is everywhere should be healthy and wealthy in terms of uh, its biodiversity. We have those riches um, right across northern Devon. We've got all sorts of pockets of different biodiversity. We've got an incredible matrix of different habitats right from the top of the moors with the blanket bogs right down to, you know, the coast and the estuary. And then under the water in the marine environment, we've got some fantastic marine life, but it all could be better. So we want to see that much more greatly enriched. We want to see people really um, enjoying that and valuing it for what it is. Um, and, you know, want to see it sort of sustainably used, you know, in terms of the fisheries, the woodlands, the forestry and farming, etc., and how the whole thing can actually work together. So it is a change in the way that people sort of use that biodiversity, but also live within it and connect to it. And uh, so the call to action is we have a nature recovery plan. Uh, we produce that with, again, our partnership, working with a whole range of stakeholders to produce um, that plan, which covers different areas like woodlands, uh, coastal areas. It covers the uplands. It covers the farms and grasslands and the wetlands. And each of those action areas are where that there's things to happen. So from an institution or if you're a farm or whatever, if you can get involved in that, that'd be great. If you're an individual, you can sign our declaration, sign our pledge for nature, and you can do the bit for you, for you, I know, around your home. That would actually sort of help with that biodiversity. So have a look at our website and look at that uh, call to action for the nature recovery plan, the declaration, and sign a pledge for nature. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, um, Andy. And that, um, that call for, for action, either organisational or individual, there's clearly your know, message. We've all got something that we can do in one way or, or another. Um, right, that's great. Um, our next speaker then is uh, Ali. Um, Ali, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Sean. Um, I'm just going to um, hopefully share my screen with you. Um, just be a couple of minutes while I get that up. Okay. Right. Uh, can I just check that you can see my screen okay? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, let me have another go. <laughs> Any slides coming up? 
can't see them. Yeah. Ah, uh, there we go. Just come. Yes. On. Okay. Yeah, we got them. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm um, really delighted to be here tonight. Um, fantastic to be sort of talking about this um, as part of your Pet Talk, Talk series. Um, I'm Ali Hawkins. I'm the Senior Wildlife Conservation Officer at Exmoor National Park Authority. Um, I feel incredibly lucky that I've worked on Exmoor for um, 20 years. So I'm um, working as an ecologist in uh, one of just 15 UK national parks. Um, before working on Exmoor, I worked for Devon Wildlife Trust and then also for the Somerset Environmental Record Centre. Um, I grew up in Cornwall, um, so I have a real affinity to the to the southwest and sort of making a difference um, to the sort of nature here. Uh, I, I went away to London to do my degree. Um, I've got an MSc in, in nature conservation. So um, yeah, I would say that my role has changed a lot um, over the last few years. Um, I think when I started with Exmoor, I was much more sort of going out and, you know, advising people on bats in their attic or doing um, botanical surveys of, of their land. But I, I think um, what our work has changed a lot, obviously, in the last few years as the sort of growing increased urgency of the nature and climate um, crisis have sort of come much more to the fore. So hopefully in the next um, 10 minutes or just under, I'm going to show a few slides and take a look at what we're doing to help the nature crisis on Exmoor. So this graph is taken from a report called the State of Nature. Um, so this has been repeated um, over um, a number of years. So this is from 2019. And sadly, you can see that from 1970, uh, the abundance of nature continues to decline. Uh, this obviously only goes up to 2016, the data here. And we've got to remember that actually all things weren't great before 1970. So nature was still declining um, before 1970. So this is just showing a little um, snippet of time. Um, we know that climate change and biodiversity loss are accelerating, as Andy said, at a very alarming rate and posing a threat to our lives, um, not just to the nature itself, but um, for Exmoor, you know, the farming practices there, the traditional ways of life. Um, and we have to do something about it to, to make a difference. So um, you probably all know Exmoor National Park. So we sit um, obviously alongside the North Devon Biosphere Reserve. Um, we're really lucky because we've got an amazing range of um, fantastic habitats. So we've got upland oak woodland, we've got lowland and upland heath, we've got amazing rivers and streams and also a fantastic coastline with some of the highest cliffs in England. So you'd like to think that, you know, we're a national park, everything is, is, is good. Um, but sadly, the national park hasn't been immune to a decline in nature. So just a few figures, 30% um, of moorland has been lost since 1940. Um, our peatlands have been degraded. And in 2001, the Exmoor Biodiversity Action Plan said that we only had 480 hectares of quality blanket bog remaining. So we've got about 13.5% of the National Park is wooded, but not all of that is in high nature value. So about 32% is conifer plantation and other areas are perhaps poorly managed. We're really concerned at the moment about the, the lack of um, flower rich meadows. So we reckon at the moment probably about 2,500 hectares of, of that left. And we really want to look at changing that around in the next few years. We've got about 80% of orchards have been lost due to development. And a lot of our rivers are not actually achieving good status. So having a look at some species then, how, how are species doing on Exmoor? Well, I sort of put together this table and obviously you don't have to look in, in great detail here, but um, on the left are a number of species that are declining or um, in fact extinct on Exmoor. So sadly, um, your red squirrel used to once be very common on Exmoor, but um, hard winters seen it um, disappear. Um, obviously, the arrival of, of the grey squirrel. And even birds like curlew that used to be such a distinctive sound on Exmoor, um, very few um, curlew breeding left now. In fact, we're not really sure whether they are successfully breeding or whether just a few um, sort of ancient birds hanging around still. On the right hand side are birds um, or species that are doing doing better. So we have birds like 
uh, Cuckoo and Windchat. So both of these are declining nationally, but still um, very much holding their own on Exmoor and actually have very good populations. One really lovely success story, we've got Dunlin breeding now after um, a 100 year gap. So that's all been down to the my restoration work that we've been doing. So that's a, that's a really good success story. And we know that we've got otters um, using all of our water courses. But when we look at the, the sort of levels and the, the sort of populations of some of these species, um, are they really at um, a, a sustainable population level? Are they, are they doing well? Um, and um, in some cases, like managing for amazing um, sort of rare butterflies at Heath and High Brown Fritillary, it's only because we've put in an awful lot of effort to keep these species on Exmoor. And for some species, we just don't have enough data and we don't know enough about them. So what can a National Park Authority um, do to help nature? So we have something called a, a partnership plan for the National Park and that sets out our ambitions uh, across the next five years. Um, similar to Andy, we work with a, a number of different partner organisations and I work closely with the Nature Conservation Advisory Panel. That's a whole mixture of conservation agencies and landowning representatives. Um, we've taken the ambition that we've written in the um, partnership plan and we've developed our own nature recovery vision which we hope will guide all of our future thinking and action. We want to make sure that our vision for nature also enables um, or is in harmony with the fact that we're a landscape designation and also the amazing cultural heritage that we have on Exmoor as well. So our nature recovery vision is based on some principles that came out of a report that was written by John Lawton in 2010. So it was called Making Space for Nature. And um, it's quite a long report, but the, the four things, four words that came out of it, um, which um, really summarise what we need to be doing, is that uh, areas for nature need to be, they need to be more, bigger, better, and they need to be joined. So it shows it here in this um, illustration, how that would work. So we need to have create new sites for wildlife. We need to make them bigger. We need to improve, as Andy said, um, the quality of the, some of the sites we already have. So Exmoor has a large area of woodland and moorland designated of, as sites of special scientific interest, but many of those aren't actually in, in great condition at the moment and a lot more work needs to be done. And then really importantly, we need to join up all of these habitats um, and link them all together. Um, it's no good just to look at little pockets anymore, perhaps little nature reserves, but we have to look at sort of large scale habitat restoration and, and how these all um, join up to create more resilient areas, um, given that climate change is happening. So they say a picture paints a thousand words and we thought about the best way to communicate our nature recovery vision and um, we commissioned a very talented um, artist that we've worked with before called Richard Allen to um, paint a couple of illustrations for us. So this first one um, shows all the factors which are leading to a decline in nature in our national park. So um, we try to cram it all into one illustration. So obviously it's sort of slightly stylized, but um, you can see the, the, the 10 points going down the side. It's a whole range of things, you know, the presence of invasive uh, non-native species, uh, the loss of peat, um, even down to how the hedgerows are, are managed, uh, a decline in, in species, as I was saying um, earlier on. And then we wanted to create um, a picture of what um, a national park might look like with, with no, more nature in it. Um, so the, the more connectivity that I was, I was mentioning. And um, so hopefully this is our, 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 vid, our vision uh, of what um, a nature rich Exmoor could look like. We've obviously got some elements of that already um, within the national park, but we feel there's a lot more that um, we, we could do. So we want um, a rich mosaic of wildlife habitats, uh, enhanced, extended and integrated into a network of nature rich hubs with sort of blurred edges between them and corridors linking them together. We want wildlife to be abundant and thriving um, where it can easily move across the landscape and adapt to a, a changing climate. Very importantly, we want Exmoor's farm landscape to remain productive with farmers ensuring that nature thrives while producing public goods and food. And of course, we want people living in and visiting the National Park to be connected to nature. 
and that they understand and inspired by Exmoor's special wildlife and are actively engaged in its conservation. So our nature recovery vision uh, links to a number of um, sort of key drivers. So there's a 25 year environment plan, which uh, mentions um, the need to create a nature recovery network. And as I mentioned, the, the Lawton report, the principles of more, bigger, better and joined. So we decided to set ourselves some sort of um, quite um, tough targets for 2030. So we, we set a number of targets which are um, pretty detailed in terms of um, creating new habitat and making existing areas um, in, in better condition and linking it all together. But we also felt it was important to have a longer term target as well. So we have a target for 2050 and we, we will aim to get at least 75% of the national park to be in nature rich condition by then. Obviously with those remaining areas, allowing wildlife to sort of permeate through them easily. So we've done quite a lot of work with the farming community to get a better idea of what they would like to do for nature, obviously sort of given no barriers in terms of, of funding. And this is um, a word cloud of um, things that they came up with, um, which is really, really encouraging because it kind of ties up very much with our thinking in the nature recovery vision. Really pleased that uh, there's a lot of interest in sort of pollinators and improving farmland, um, getting more uh, species rich meadows back, managing woodlands, um, doing field boundaries of pollinators. So all of the things which would really, really help to deliver uh, more for wildlife. So the nature, our nature recovery vision is already supporting um, some really brilliant work across Exmoor. I think um, it's all scales, which I think is really exciting. So um, it might be people who've recently retired and moved to Exmoor and they have uh, some land and they really love to manage it for nature. Um, we've, even, we've got up to sort of the large private estates, which are really now beginning to think um, in a different way about how to sort of manage their land going forward into the future. So, um, yeah, I mentioned the work um, earlier on uh, to, with the success with the Dunlins returning. So a lot of that has been brought about by the Southwest Peatland Partnership. Uh, they've restored 2,500 hectares of peatlands across Exmoor since 1998. And I've been delighted to be involved in that work, um, setting it up right at the beginning. Um, they've recently got a really big pot of money through the Nature of the Climate Fund, and that will allow them to uh, um, deliver a lot more peatland restoration across Exmoor, Dartmoor and Bodmin Moor. We're really lucky to have uh, quite a lot of land on Exmoor that's owned and managed by the National Trust. Um, we work with the Honeycutt and the West Exmoor teams, and both of them have an amazing vision that very much accords with the, our overall nature recovery vision, where they want to um, join habitats up, um, make, make it much, much more dynamic and led by natural processes. They've tried, uh, they're trying at the moment uh, an enclosed beaver trial, which is um, really interesting. And um, a few months ago, they had their first beaver kit um, born. So that was, um, that was very exciting. So the, the lady in the middle of the photo there with her son and the lovely um, dog, um, that's a farmer uh, called Holly Purdy, and she farms at, at Horner Farm, uh, which is a, a National Trust uh, tenanted farm. And um, I, I'm really inspired by Holly and the work that she's doing on her farm. Um, I really love her ethos. Uh, I've got a lovely quote from Holly. She says, we farm to our environment as opposed to changing our environment for our farming system. We believe in an integrated approach where production is not removed, but run in harmony with our natural world. We listen to our animals, grasslands and soils to make informed choices to produce nutrient rich food while rebuilding biodiversity. We believe these go hand in hand for forward thinking approach on Exmoor. So while some landowners like Holly are already embracing the idea of regenerative land management, for others, we need to bring them with us, perhaps with some small steps first. Uh, the National Park Authority this year, we set up a new pilot project called Sowing the Seeds. And we're working with Exmoor farmers and smallholders to begin to create new flower rich meadows. And we're really hoping that that will gain, gain a lot of interest over the next few years. So what are our next steps to deliver the vision? Um, we want to work at all scales with everyone, with communities, um, landowners, 
woodland owners um, right across the national park to see how we can make a difference. We really want to celebrate where people are delivering great things for nature. We want to share that interest and, and that knowledge between people. We want to really maximise funding opportunities. So we've got a new fund at the moment called Farming and Protected Landscapes, and that's going to be available over the next three years to help bring in some uh, additional money to help deliver uh, nature benefits. And we really want to connect people to nature and, and help them understand you know, what we're trying to achieve through our vision. So a couple of photos of my own children there enjoying nature. <laughs> and then um, finally, um, I really love this quote from David Attenborough. He says, one thing we do know that if nature is given the chance, it can bounce back, but we have to sort of t take action now. As Andy said, I think it's um, currently um, quite a scary time but also a, also a challenging and an exciting time to be working in sort of nature um, conservation and um, you know I feel sort of really honoured that I'm working in such a sort of amazing part of, um, of the southwest. Thanks very much. No, thank you very much Alan. Some uh, amazing images there as well of um, Exmoor and, and life across it um, and I, I mean that that point that you mentioned of us living in exciting times so if we are kind of one minute to midnight those people that are involved in creating solutions are going to be busy and with a lot of exciting work to do I suppose but um, so with that with that in mind uh, quickly uh, without further ado on to our next speaker uh, uh, our next speaker is Claire Moody from Plastic Free North Devon Claire you're on mute still Claire Good start. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, hi, I'm Claire Moody. I'm the chief exec of a small charity um, based in North Devon called Plastic Free North Devon. Um, we set up about, uh, what was it, four years ago off the black of um, a huge kind of nationwide surface against sewage campaign, which was geared towards and, and titled Plastic Free Communities. And what that did was it gave volunteers and people within the communities um, working on you know environmental conservation issues and um, some tools to start actually addressing the plastic pollution at source within the communities um and that was a five-step program where we where we, whereby we were talking to local councils local businesses community groups um and various other members and what it did is it um empowered um people like myself and other people in the community to actually start addressing the, the problem within our community for ourselves rather than kind of relying on someone else to fix it and um Plastic Free North Devon grew um, like a kind of beautiful flower from that. Um, and as time went on, I think, we, you know, we discovered actually um, that there was a lot more as community members um, within our community that we could be doing. Um, and we actually set up in our own charity, I think, in about a year later after being community group for about a year. Um, I'm just going to share my screen if I can. Um, one sec. And I'll just... Um, so I haven't used this platform for one sec. Screen. Don't know which one. Um. Mm -mm, sorry. This one. Sorry. Right. So I got so many screens open. That's the problem, isn't it? As long as you don't start talking about um, Peppa Pig, we don't care. Um. <laughs> so can you? Oh, if I just I make that big, can you see that? Brilliant. Yeah, excellent. Got it. So yeah, essentially, Plastic Free North Seven is on a mission to protect and improve our environment through community-led action. And up until a couple of weeks ago, that actually said to tackle plastic pollution. But um, as we've evolved over the last four years, and as you've kind of seen, you know, plastic has been a great, great engager um, for connecting people with. Um, the problem with our society. So I think for years and years and years, conservation has kind of maybe not been, um, uh, I suppose, I think people haven't been able to access or kind of felt connected with tackling the problem. 
And I think plastic um, gave us this opportunity to actually go, okay, this you use this stuff and this stuff's ending up in our oceans. It's affecting our biosity. It's destroying, you know, the planet that we live on. And I think people were suddenly able to engage with something that they could do because actually they were using that object within their own everyday lives. And it's essentially plastic pollution has been a symptom of how we've been treating our planet for, for a really, really long time. Um, and I think why Plastic Free North Devon has been um, quite successful locally is because it basically it galvanized that community on an issue and connected them with so much so the work that you know Andy and Exmoor Park and stuff are doing now I feel like what we've done with Plastic Free North Devon is kind of starting to try and join those two so when um when we talk about actually how we meet our mission obviously we tackle plastic pollution head on um but the really important one for us is inspiring a reconnection with nature and I think um you know you only protect what you love and essentially and what you've ever experienced and often what we find especially in North Devon and, and, and throughout lots of areas within that live in kind of you know places where that has a biosphere and or places of kind of environmental importance actually you have a lot of the population that actually aren't connected with um those areas and actually um how can we expect them to kind of want to protect it if they're not actually connected with it so i think one of the things that we really try and work on is how do we connect more people within our community with this kind of amazing thing that we have on our doorstep and you know our amazing planet which is in obviously a dire state of affairs and actually how do we then engage people into action um and that's where the kind of facilitating sustainable bay behavior change kind of bit comes in it's kind of like okay what you know, I think when people think about the the issues that are going on now and what, what's been going on with COP, you know, the, the scale of the issues of what we face um, in the kind of generations to come are quite um, are quite frightening and quite scary. And actually, I think for those, you know, the guys that are at college with you guys now and that younger generation, they, they're really probably really feeling the weight of this issue. And, you know, what we do in the next five to 10 years is really going to dictate whether we manage to keep global warming below 1.5. And the problem can feel absolutely massive. Um, but I think what what Plastic Free North Devon and what we try and do as a charity is kind of like facilitate tools for people to do the right thing um, within our community. And, you know, if you have lots of people doing lots of really good stuff together, that will hopefully create a wave of change. But one of the things we found with um, the pandemic in particular, with, with, with our kind of approach to plastic pollution was, you know, it was everywhere, you know, it was like we went back, you know, COVID happened and we went back kind of five, 10 years. I mean, the amount of single use plastics that were being thrown about, I mean, you only have to look in your own bin um, or your kids that go to school, the amount of plastic that's chucked away with the amount of tests and stuff that we're all having to do. Um, a lot of a lot of cafes and stuff were reverting back to using single use packaging. Um, so it was a really big step back. And actually, it kind of um, it really made us think about, OK, well, what we can't actually keep banging on to the individual. Actually, it's a really hard thing to talk to people about. And actually what we need to do is create um, opportunities for people to take action in different ways. Um, and that's kind of where the inspired um, connection with nature stuff comes from as well. But also, you know, um, you can still walk into a supermarket and feel like we haven't got anywhere with a plastic pollution crisis. You know, you can still buy magazines that have got toys on the front. You know, you've got um, fruit and vegetables that's completely wrapped in plastic. You know, it feels like I feel like we and you know, it's on, on beaches as well. You know, you only have to walk along um, the likes of Croyd or Woolacombe and they are absolutely littered with tiny bits of microplastics. And again, the problem feels pretty overwhelming. Um, but actually, um, beach cleans and things like that are obviously... Um, super um great for connecting people with the problem and then that's where the conversations and stuff come from um and i think for us um one of the major opportunities for um for us kind of i suppose with biodiversity and a kind of um the nature that we have on our doorstep in terms of our what we're trying to tackle is if is is an access is an accessibility thing so one of the things that we um discovered i'm going to stop sharing my screen so i actually don't need to share it now sorry so I can actually see you all, um, is an accessibility thing. So um, we, I'm just going to close my, oh, no, sorry, one sec. Oh. Ah, I can see you all again. Um, so one of the things that we um, launched about uh, two years ago was a, a bodyboard campaign, which was essentially aimed at trying to get people to stop buying the flimsy, cheap, um, bodyboards um, that were causing kind of polystyrene to be littered right the way across our beaches. Um, and we launched a Protect Our Playground wooden bodyboard scheme and we um, got some local beaches to start hiring them. We also sell them. We've got about four or five partners now. Um, 
But one of the things that really um, struck us was actually, you know, how accessible is that are those places for a lot of those people as well? And actually, um, one of the things that we um, started to lobby the council with is actually, you know, is there is there a need to, you know, not everyone in North Devon can access these places. Buses are expensive. They're infrequent. Parking's really expensive as well. And actually, um, could we offer, you know, free buses um, for people at the weekends and during school holidays so that everyone can access this um, this amazing place that we live? And one of the things that we proposed was that, you know, those sort of kind of offerings were given to maybe kind of the lower income vulnerable people in our community but actually it was given with information about the fact that you're in a biosphere the fact that you have Exmoor National Park and maybe a map with some of the kind of the, the really amazing places that we actually have on our on our doorstep so it wasn't just a case of giving free buses it was actually trying to join the dots of why we're trying to get these people to access these blue spaces and actually if we can connect more of our community with um, with what's on a doorstep then surely that they'll want to take more action and action doesn't just you know you start with maybe reducing your plastic but then you go on to thinking about what you can do with your garden you go on to thinking about what you can do with your own home and actually you know what we really try and challenge people to do now is to really think about their own network so um, everyone has got maybe if they've got children they've got a school that they go to they've got a workplace um, and essentially you know, we're all connected to those different networks and all it takes is for one person to kind of write a few letters to the school or write, you know, bring something up at a board meeting. And actually you kind of start to see that trickle of change going out. So rather than I think sometimes I think for like people kind of come to um, these kind of environmental things and kind of rely on groups to kind of do the work. But actually the work is going to be it has to be in order for us to meet the crisis that we face. It has to be done by everyone in all these different sectors and we have to do more of the joining the dots. Um, so the other challenge, um, the other kind of opportunity is obviously the visitors that we get. Um, obviously, we've got five million visitors, day visitors a year um, to North Devon. Um, and one of the things that we've also done was to, um, we launched a visitor campaign, um, Exmoor Park, I think we're involved. And, and we actually did a specific one for Exmoor National Park um, and for um, kind of the more coastal areas. But essentially what it involved is accommodation providers coming on. Um, and sending out information about the area that they were coming to. So it raised the profile of the biosphere, the A and B, and inside um, the document had like various kind of 10 steps about the sorts of things that they could do while they were here, whether that was recycling, shopping locally, um, you know, using public transport and all that sort of stuff. So um, I think, you know, we have a huge opportunity, you know, North Devon is, is such an amazing, complex and beautiful place and it really a gem. Um, and I think we can really use that to set an example to actually then when people because often often when people come on holiday, what we found is you often remember things more. Um, you have more of an emotional connection to something that you might hear or see. And then actually when you go back to your community, um, it might be something that you want to roll out there as well. So the visitor for us is a is a is a is a really big opportunity and a challenge and um something that we want to kind of build on for going forward. Um and the thing I kind of I suppose I really want to finish on is, you know, for us, I think it's kind of time to really up the game <laughs> in terms of all of these things. And how do we connect? You know, we sit on the Biosphere Partnership and we sit on the AOMB Partnership and we go to, you know, we join in with as much as we can. But I think it's, you know, all of us to really challenge us to think about how we expand our bubbles. How do we get more people involved in the things that we're doing? And that's where the Pledge for Nature that the Biosphere Project um, is running, which has been amazing for kind of getting people involved and in actually what they can do for nature. Um, and obviously the declaration for businesses and stuff as well. So those tools are definitely starting to be out there but what we just kind of need to amplify and yeah just just yeah, raise the bar basically that that's me thanks thank you claire uh, really interesting your um the way kind of plastics free became a kind of symbol for agency and activism more widely it's a kind of unlocking that in, in empowerment and that kind of uh, call to arms to to affect change i thought it was uh, Really fascinating. Um, uh, thank you very much. Our, our final speaker, and um, before we uh, open the questions, and as I say, do I say a number of people have got questions in the in the chat? We'll come to those in a minute. Do be um, adding those as you go through. But our final speaker is uh, Jenny. Jenny, over to you. Can you hear us, Jenny?
Jenny? We're having a, a few uh, technical problems. Jenny, can you hear me? Because we can't see you at the moment. Oh, good evening, everybody. Uh, apologies, I'm having a few uh, difficulties with connection. So um, uh, you may lose me halfway That's through. That's great, we got you now. On. Would you mind uh, sharing my slides, please? Thank you. So I'm the, um, I work at, oh, hello? It's coming up now. Yeah, we've got you. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you, but... Go ahead, Jenny, Hi, we can I hear can you. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. We can. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to share my screen because I'm having a few uh, difficulties with connection. Great. So I'm just going to on... crack on and hopefully you'll be able to hear me. But I'm going to turn my camera off. So hopefully then I'll be able to stay with you. Your slides are on screen. So Jenny. I'm the so project you've... delivery manager for technology transfer. And I'm also currently working with Petroc to. Oh, love... Thank you. So I'm the project delivery manager for technology transfer and I'm also um, uh, just just looking into being oh dear Jenny's been having some uh, connectivity issues I'm afraid and um, we seem to have lost her completely uh, there what we might do is see if we can um, bring her back uh, in a minute and see if we can uh, uh, get some of her um, insights in a moment. But if I may, well, um, while we're doing that, um, if I can go into um, posing some of the questions that we've had in the uh, in the chat. So um, uh, first one uh, is the question about that question of natural capital that you introduced to us, Andy. Um, how do we turn our natural capital into economic prosperity for local communities, especially in historically underfunded and low income areas of, of North Devon? That's from Letza Gorman. Um, Andy, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, that's a fabulous question. <clears throat> and thank you for that one, Letza. Um We do have a number of projects where we're working on to develop that. I mean, I, I always take natural capital with a pinch of salt um, because it tends to be very anthropocentric. Um, we need to look at other things in biodiversity that are just not sort of so human centered. We can, you know, there's, there's things like, you know, the freshwater pearl mussel. What does a freshwater pearl mussel does for humans? But it, it has a right to exist. But on the on the natural capital side, how to attract the funding in? We've got a few things going on. So the first thing to, to remember about North Devon is 80% of the tourists come here because of the environment. You know, that's surveys that have been seen since, you know, 2010 regularly said that so we could we do have a base of income that's based on that natural capital and the key thing there is to make sure we can keep on enhancing that and make sure we still keep the goose that lays the golden egg in, in terms of that one but how can we enhance that further how can we get better value out of the tourism that helps us do that and how, how can we make it year-long tourism rather than boom and bust over the summer months so that that's one of the, the first ones is changing that and we have had a program with um european funding which looked at um, how to develop more experiential tourism based in the environment and also restores the environment at the same time. Um, there is things like, you know, regenerative farming, which there we're looking at, you know, the ways of, again, there's some comments in the in the text and the uh, comments at the side there about, well, you know, how do we change the land use and about to sort of make it much more sympathetic towards um, some of those ecosystem services we get, like carbon in the soils, like biodiversity and all those sort of things and you know again extracting those benefits that it does for us the economic gain on that is actually supply chain assurance because people are getting more and more savvy about looking at where their food comes from and therefore if you want to make sure that those producers have a guaranteed market at the end of the day then making sure they can meet 
those farming guarantee standards in terms of economic standard uh, environmental standards is one of the ways to to ensure that so again it's that assurance of, of continuing things from my own background in woodlands and forestry um at least half the woodlands in north devon are not being managed and in terms of biodiversity a managed woodland is more biodiverse than the one that's just st stood there still dying on its feet literally so a bit more churn and management inside woodlands is actually good so uh, getting woodlands back into management creating the timber and the opportunities for that but also the other things we can do in there like charcoal other produce and tourism is something we can exploit so hence you know there's a, there's a bigger economic case there for more and bigger woodlands um, but also looking at the ways that they can sort of feature in terms of uh, river, river riparian defence and the like, which, you know, that, that economic case there is that it actually saves abortive costs on some of the flood defence um, works that happen. So if you can actually sort of plant more woodlands that are and more wetlands that are re reducing the flow down the river, when it comes to a pig flow, then you're not spending so much on those defensive costs down in, within the communities. From a marine perspective, we're working on things like um, blue carbon. So everybody sort of starts raving about um, kelp beds uh, and about mariculture, you know, raising sort of seaweed, what we can do in terms of that extractive use to sequester that carbon, but also uh, seagrass beds. We're looking at the opportunities for that inside the estuary. Jenny's uh, return. And also things like low impact fisheries, because at the moment there's a kind of um, the management of fisheries is very much at the whim of the the larger uh, ICs, these are the International Council for Exploitation of the Seas, which manage on big blocks. But what we've discovered in um, our work in the marine part is that actually we've got populations which could be managed on a much more closer uh, and more granular level. So working with the fishermen and that local knowledge, we can then have a more guaranteed fisheries and marine-based economy as well working with that. And underpinning some of this, again, so it's that's all looking at land-based and water-based, very direct things. But we have a project at the moment called Smart Biosphere where there's a lot of digital technology going into monitoring the environment, having that digital twin so we can predict what's what's there, what's happening, what's going wrong. So there's all those digital skills which then help uh, farmers and foresters and fisheries managers understand what's happening and going on in their areas, which improves that environment performance. So it's using high-tech to start um, making sure we minimize the impact. So yeah. it's using the technology for, for those gains. So in terms of skills development, we are looking for people who are good with IT, good with using that digital technology, as well as all that those traditional land-based skills and looking at new ways of applying those skills. That's really interesting, um, Andy. And that, that question of technology was one of the ones that I, I had come to. I, I wonder, Ali and Claire, in a moment, I, I want to come to you and kind of follow up from um, from Andy's comments, that initial question, the one about um, kind of farming and land use and how we get those sort of changes, but also the other, that question, Claire, of tourism and, you know, if if tourists come for the environment, how we encourage them to be, um, to think about their contribution and, you know, whether they can be better kind of climate citizens when they're tourists or whether they kind of give up on that but jenny your signal looks much better than it was before i wonder whether we might have a go at getting you back in and and getting through your slides i spoke too soon didn't i <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I don't know where I got to because I put my slides up and then um, carried on talking when, when I wasn't on the screen. So I don't know if you actually heard anything that I was saying. We didn't get beyond your first slide. Helen, I wonder if you could put the slides back up and then Jenny might be able to start talking. There we are, Jenny. I don't know whether you can see your slides that are up, um, but you're, you were telling us about the technology transfer um, project. Um, so 
I was just talking about how the yeah. Great. So we've had students who who have uh, been lucky enough to have the opportunity to work with businesses who have been embedded embedding biodiversity into their businesses, and um, one that we've been working with, uh, which is in the photos on slide three, is. Um, sweet pea and sunflower and this uh, business actually grows their own flowers um, and greenery no, um, let, sorry can't have the dinner as too oily okay so it grows their own flowers and greenery and um, then arranges them into bouquets for weddings and um general uh, nice bouquets to, yeah. to people for special occasions and all the growing that she does is um in season and um native uh where she can so that's that was a really good opportunity for students in involved to explore how the low Local businesses have embedded biodiversity into work, and you can see how her growing technique. She's um, uh, separating um, the plants, and um, she doesn't use pesticides. She obviously encourages um, natural uh, pest um, regulation. So uh, that was great for the students involved to explore explore how local businesses have embedded biodiversity into their work. Um, we've got a couple of other businesses that we're working with too. Uh, um, another uh, vegetable grower in um, the Coombe area, uh, kind of close to Coombe Martin, and also Marshford Organics, which is it's great. Uh, uh, we also have okay, so if you could go to the next slide, please, Helena. Um, on my next slide, um, I've got some information about what we're doing in Petrop related to uh, sustainability degrees that are hopefully coming forward. We've got foundation degrees for the September period. So I'm currently working as program manager uh, for one of those. Um, and it's going to be really exciting to. Sorry, excuse me. To see how that's going to play out. We can hear you okay, Jenny. So do keep going. Um... And there's going to be lots of opportunities within that degree to university and incorporate it into into how the degrees delivered to so just moving on to my last slide um we were um i'm looking thinking about ways that we can all play an active role in the future um to reduce the loss of biodiversity um and uh thinking about ways that we can change our habits and change our behavior from reducing the pollution and what um obviously thinking about what we're buying that items that Claire has been talking about with plastic free um, and supporting environmentally friendly practices. 
So in everything we buy, really, from furniture to um, construction, food processes, um, everything there. And I was also thinking about as educators, I want to um, think about in the future as we embed the sustainability goals into our learning practices across Petrock, to think about the role that we'll put we play with engaging students with environmentally friendly sustainable practices and um, incorporating environmentally friendly sustainable human land use into our uh, teaching for students as well so they're aware of those um, options available and again as as educators as educators, um, I think it's our role to increase awareness. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, to increase the awareness of biodiversity um, areas and to enable all to have ownership of our natural environment so um thinking about exmoor national park uh i know that um some some students uh won't have had access to it i've actually been part of a um new audience I'm terribly sorry, everybody, about the um, the technical problems we're having with um, Jenny's connection. One of the things we're not necessarily blessed with um, within Northern Devon is super fast broadband across um, all of our uh, area yet. But I'm sure that will be something that we will work on and will help us with some of these agendas. Um, I, I wonder whether we might come back to uh, taking some of those questions, building on Andy's point, where he was talking about um, natural capital and how it can support um, some economic development um, for a kind of lower income uh, people. Ali, I wonder whether you might pick up that um, question um, that was uh, has been posed around um, food production. So said, inspired by that way that they were um, farming with the environment, how can we um, support and encourage um, farmers to do more of that? And is there a role for kind of micro food production, kind of our own kind of garden um, kind of food production? Thanks, Sean. <clears throat> yeah, in terms of sort of how we can encourage, I guess, other farmers to sort of follow Holly Purdy's approach. I think um, there's a lot to be said for, as I was saying sort of earlier on, sort of sharing the best of what people are doing with each other. I, I think um, farmers love nothing more than going to have a look around other people's farms to see see what they're doing. And, and um, of course, they want to know the sort of how it's stacking up financially. So I think that we need to share the, the the sort of the evidence, don't we? The sort of um, the finances uh, with others so that they have perhaps more confidence that they can perhaps, um, perhaps go down a, a different route in terms of their sort of farming practices. So there's been some really interesting research done by um, someone called Chris Clark, who uh, wrote a report called Less is More. He was based up in Yorkshire. Uh, he's now actually moved down to North Devon. And uh, he was looking particularly at upland farms and looking at the economics behind them. Um, and it very much sort of his research came out that um, obviously a lot of farms you know have a lot of overhead expenses in terms of sort of expensive machinery and tractors and um you know um fertilizers and as soon as you begin to bring those costs down um you become you, you get to a sweet spot where you have um you know less um less overhead expenses um perhaps your stocking rate is lower but your overall your profitability is is going up so it's a really interesting sort of um comparison between sort of like productivity and, and profitability um with obviously the you know profitability perhaps being more where you have less stock but you bring all your overhead costs down um and that's the sort of approach that you know holly purdy's taking at, at horner farm so 
I think that's really interesting and hopefully going to work with Chris Clark to try and do some um, research on Exmoor um, to look at that. I suppose also sort of looking forward to the future. We're at the moment um, waiting for 2024 for the new environmental land management scheme to, to sort of come into place. And there have been various sort of DEFRA test and trials to see how that, you know, how that might work and sort of hoping, hopefully take the best elements of some of those tests and trials to feed into the the new schemes, which are um, very much going to be targeted at, at nature recovery. Um, and in the meantime, as I mentioned earlier on, we have a fund called the Farming and Protected Landscape Scheme, which hopefully will help some farmers to sort of think differently about perhaps how they might transition and perhaps how they might be able to change their farming practices and that, um, you know, there's some funding there to help them to do that. Great. OK, thank you, Ali. Um, Claire, um, that, um, some of that kind of question of, uh, I guess, economic act activity, but kind of tourism and the environment, um, it, 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 it strikes me it's both a moment that people think and reflect and perhaps change their worldview, but also is it a time when they become less sensitive to the environment and um, say, I'm not bothering with all of that recycling business, I'm on holiday? You're on mute, sorry. Yeah. Um uh, interesting question. Yeah, I think some people when they do go on holiday just kind of forget where they are and what they're doing. But I think, you know, you kind of have to guide these people and we have to plant okay. the seeds in as many places as we can. And, you know, I think, you know, if we can get a collective, um, you know, um, I suppose, agree. you know, one of the things, a massive issue with when people become on holiday in terms of recycling is that there's no standardised recycling across the whole of the UK. So people are easily confused. And when they get confused and they're busy and they'd rather be drinking on the beach and watching a sunset than worrying about whether people are recycling, those sorts of things kind of go out the window. So one of the one of the really good things that we could do across North, even just if we could do it across North Devon, standardising the recycling practices that we have at the beaches, that what we have in the town with what we have in our homes and what we have in our schools and our businesses. But there's no, unfortunately, because of the beaches are, you know, most of them are privately owned and the access is probably owned and you know, you don't have that, um, you, know, you just don't have that connectivity. So there's definitely a need to, you know, we can't expect people to do the right thing without putting the tools there. You know, there is no public recycling throughout our, our, our really our high streets at all. There's pockets of it. Um, it's easily contaminated. You've got some places still giving out plastic, but then you've got other places giving out compostable and the biodegradable items that look like plastic, but contaminate recycling. So it's a, it's really complex. And um, there's a whole heap of work to do at that upper level to kind of get people to you know we keep banging on about, about what individuals should be doing but actually the tools aren't there so i think when we, if you're bringing it back to tourists one of the things we could do is obviously stand there so i think that's probably not going to happen for a long time so it's like okay how do we if people are visiting this area and like andy said 80 percent of people come here because of what's on our doorstep um they already kind of are connected a little bit with the environment so it's kind of taking them on that journey and going okay well yeah, this, this is lovely. And I know this beach looks really clean, but actually get down on the sand, look at the river, look at the amount of microplastics, you know, look at those images of what Exmoor was showing you a minute ago about what it is and what that actual visualisation is of what kind of to be kind of, um, I suppose, when we talk about the environment being restored, I think it's a really hard concept for general public to understand um so what i, I remember we're seeing that map that Exmoor National Park did and I thought that's so brilliant because actually it's starting to really kind of you know, I think we talk to kind of Joe blogs on the street and you talk about, you know, biodiversity and all that sort of stuff. They don't really, you know, they look across a green field or they see a nice beach and they kind of think, oh, that's a nice environment. That's lovely. But actually, like, we, you know, our, our nature is in decline. But actually, what is it that we want to be seeing? So we all kind of buy into this collective vision of what North Devon should look like. And there's a, a whole heap of work to do on that piece, I think. Um, yeah. Great. Thank thank you. Um, and move on to... Uh, Another question, question now, uh, one from uh, Paul uh, Smith. Um, uh, Paul kind of um, asked the question about, and it's, it's kind of the one of e um, economic development within uh, uh, the, the biosphere. You know, and, and Paul says, you know, if, if ilk of de development involves dumping enormous amounts of concrete onto the, um, onto, to, to building on the, the seafront, how, how do you mobilise to challenge that, and what are the alternatives? Um, who wants to take that first? Andy, let's come to you again. Thank you for that. 
it's uh, I mean, it is a tough one. I mean, it, it, I mean, the, the, the thing there by the Water Sports Centre, I think, was there. We were trying to sort of get more people to enjoy that environment, exploit the benefits there. But mm. can you do that without actually causing a bit of damage? And now with the Environment Act, um, there has to be biodiversity offsets to or biodiversity net gain to actually sort of try and compensate and mitigate that. So there are, you know, we, we started piloting that uh, idea of biodiversity offsetting a few years ago as a, as a national trial. And uh, we, we came up with some extra rules as well. You know, there were, there were some bits you don't cross, you know, like ancient woodlands, you do not touch. You know, if anybody tried to think we could compensate for those sort of things, what we call the critical um, environmental capital, then you just say, we, we're not going to play, we're not going to sort of touch that in terms of compensation. So there are bits where we, we can say, Definitely no go, but other bits where the, the habitat is recreatable or it's enhanced somewhere else, and that can be enhanced somewhere which can actually do more good, then that can be a benefit. But we should never say that that uh, you can develop anywhere and compensate everything because that's just making a license to trash. So it's okay. um, it's a slippy slope. You need to sort of manage it very carefully. Um, but it, it does mean that we can develop and work in some areas, and it would be sort of for good benefit. We have to make sure that the net gain is actually there. And it, it, by the sound of it, there's, it's important to have models that you can work to to make sure that you're paying attention to and calculating all of these things so that we don't just um, unconsciously um, do damage rather than, you know, um, knowing what, what kind of compromises we're making if we are. Um, Ali, a slightly different question from Simon uh, Gooch, and it kind of uh, plays into the point that the, with the biosphere is protecting, you know, a marine... Um, habitat. The um, Exmoor is, is is protecting a whole range of habitats. Um, uh, yeah, should we? Um, do we want national parks or reserve for all habitats? And what challenges would that bring if we did? Hmm. So that's a, an interesting question from Simon. Um, so, I mean, speaking from the Exmoor perspective, uh, we do have. Um, do we want national parks reserves for all habitats? We only get Sorry. difficult questions at Petrock Talks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I guess we've got quite a diversity of um, habitats within Exmoor. Um, so within the national park, obviously, then there are the other levels of protection. So like the sites of special scientific interest, and then we've got the European sites of special areas of conservation so they tend to be the the woodlands and the and the heathlands um and the rivers and streams um and then i mean we don't have the remit that the biosphere reserve has going out to the sea um with the national park uh obviously the biosphere reserve goes uh, a long way out as we saw by by andy's map um but but yes i, I think we have those statutory sites that are, that are recognised and then some of the other important habitats are also sort of recognised through um, designations like county wildlife sites that are sort of overseen by the local wildlife trusts. So not sure if that's answered the question, but I don't know if any, Andy's got anything else to add to that. It was, it was just, yeah, I mean, when the, the habitats directive, when we were in Europe, was good. Um, when that came out, that sort of stipulated we have to have sort of representation of all the different sort of key habitats okay. um, presented. So in which case there are, every type of habitat is, is protected. Mm. Uh, every type of natural habitat or semi-natural habitat is protected. So hence, you know, the evolution of sort of biodiversity action plans and the like. So in a way that that, that is covered. But um, whether you, the type of designation, because the national parks originally were, were a landscape and recreation Mm. designation that's their primary purpose and AON piece is a landscape designation as its primary purpose now with the Glover review they're going to build in biodiversity I hope and hence the FIPL the farming and protected landscapes that both of those um, designations work is, is sort of bringing those strengths to that and all the work that Ali's done over the last years that she's been in there is now going to sort of really sort of come to fruition hope it get augmented um, so the choice of those landscape areas was based on you know what was perceived as being special landscapes, but it, again, it comes back to what about the bits in between, and how, yeah. how do they fit? Okay, thank you, um, Andy. Um, Clara, I want to pose a, a, a question to you. Uh, it was um, 
right up on the, the, the start of our question, but plays into this kind of question. We, we It's a kind of hearts and minds question. Um, yeah, Andy was just describing how the, the notion of natural capital is about talking to the Treasury in the terms that the Treasury values things. And so you um, but you talked about, you know, we protect the things we love, which was a very kind mm. of emotional kind of hearts thing. Um, mm. Helena says, um, asked the question, um, you know, rather than describing the things in the terms of uh, the, the Treasury, should we create a, look to create a new culture the, of value? Um, and, and turn those things around. What's your view? You know, where, you know, how do we play these? Um, these um, I think, yeah, it's, it's kind of trying to get everyone to value the very thing that, you know, we're talking about in terms of biodiversity terms, but in, in a way that people can understand. And I think, you know, having that visualization, that collective visualization of what we want to see and why we want to see it and how we can actually all benefit from it is, is, is a big piece of work. And it's something that, you know, we should be all working towards. And in a sense, you know, all these issues are so interlinked, you know, plastic pollution, climate change, uh, you know, biodiversity loss, you know, and it's all kind of created to the systems that our our society currently run on. And unfortunately, until we kind of, you know, really challenge the way that we, this, our system and, you know, our GDPR and all that, sort of how our society is measured, we're not going to get the traction of change that's really needed. And, you know, you only have to look at, um, you know, when we think about plastic pollution in particular as a singular issue, you know, we are plastic production is due to quadruple by 2050, you know, and it's, you know, there's while, you know, the less reliance um, comes on oil for kind of cars and things like that, like, you know, more of that is going to be pumped into other avenues like um, kind of synthetics and plastic and stuff. So um, that's the reality. That's and until we start really addressing um some of the really challenging issues you know if we keep taking oil out of the ground then we are going to have a massive issue on our hands and you know trying to think about connect those dots with you know we have to start addressing the elephant in the room we can't keep doing what we're doing um and trying to give people an action point to start addressing those things i mean you know people are on the streets calling for this young people are desperate for us to take more um kind of uh bolder action and i think you know between us we need to create a system where people don't feel completely overwhelmed but that we create that we have areas where people can continue to take action and that's where like the work that we do you know with facilitating those options and then what Andy does and what Ali are doing like that's kind of all part and parcel but it, it kind of just yeah needs to be amplified and um one of the, the biggest things that we've done is um in terms of connecting people with what's on our doorstep is our ocean explorer program which uses basically virtual reality to actually um take people diving um on lundy with the seals um to get them looking at rock pools um to do a river to sea journey a kind of from the tour and the torridge um to actually really kind of yeah engage people with that with that biodiversity but yeah there's a whole piece to do on language there's a whole piece to do you know and actually these some you know the large pockets of North Devon and in particular the southwest have huge areas of deprivation you know some kids actually haven't been to the beach um and so these kids these some of these kids are growing up and feeling really disconnected with with the very thing that we're talking about and you know we need you know 25 percent I think of our society to trying to kind of come on this journey with us in terms of trying to create the system change but we need to involve more people and and part of that is improving the accessibility um and getting into schools and what Andy and the guys at the Biosphere are doing with the blue and green economy, creating those opportunities and aspirations and jobs within North Devon that will hopefully, hopefully raise. But, you know, all these issues are interrelated and yeah, it's a massive challenge ahead, but um, yeah, lots to do. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Well, and, and on that question of, of lots to do, um, I'm going to come to each of you in a minute as we wind up because time's gone, gone so quickly. I'm already over um, the quarter past when we were due to finish. But uh, my, my question that I'll, I'll be posing to you I mean, what what one thing would you want all of us that are on this uh, uh, this call uh, today um, to do to protect biodiversity um, when we get up tomorrow? So I'll, I'll come to you on that. I think one of the things that Jenny might um, have said where her connection and stood up is talking about that new degree that uh, Petroc has in sustainable environment um, management and um, great opportunity for anybody locally that wants to uh, develop high level skills and knowledge in that area. We hope that it will be a degree that also brings people to the area who are passionate about um, 
sustainability. And, um, you know, you can do sustainable management in Birmingham City University, but, you know, if you do it somewhere in a uh, where there's a lot of environment to be caring about, I think you will learn a lot more. Um, for those people on that programme, um, where's a college pay them £1,200 to undertake work with regional organisations? And so for, um, for all of the organisations on the call um, here, that's a, a lot of free skilled labour for you to carry out um, yeah. Yeah, high level tasks that you might want um, them to do for you. So do make touch with Jenny, uh, get in touch with Jenny about that or indeed any of our um, other um, degree programmes because you can get people in business, mechanics, digital, you know, whatever you like. Um, so finally, um, on to those questions. Uh, um, Ali, to you first, what one thing do you think we could, that, that you would want each of us to uh, do or think about um, to protect biodiversity? So my one thing is if we could all 10% um, for nature. So if you have a garden, 10% of it for nature. If you have a farm, you know, look at how you can give 10% for nature. If we all did that, that would add up to an awful lot. So on Exmoor, that would be 7,000 hectares. So that would be my one thing, 10% for nature. 10% for nature, really um, uh, pithy as well. I shall certainly remember that. Andy? Yeah, I was going to pitch it a little bit easy because perhaps people are not ready for that yet. So I'll, I'll go for the, the, yeah. the ones who are just kind of newbies to this. So I would say just um, when you step outside tomorrow, just, just think or look at for one species. It could be a bird, it could be a plant, whatever. Just go back and learn about it and observe a bit more about it and sort of get to know and love and understand it. And let it grow from there. That's brilliant, Andy. Yeah, that's a really simple one for us to think about. And Claire? Um... Oh, this is really hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one thing. Um, I think my thing would be just to get out in it more. Um, so get out in nature as much as you can. Immer not just, you know, walking is great, whatever kind of you can in terms of your own abilities, but immerse yourself in the ocean if you can. You know, that feeling of, you know, when we when we immerse ourselves in nature, there does something amazing. And there's obviously lots of evidence that comes kind of, kind of this chemical, lovely thing in our brains, which makes us kind of connect with and what's around us and kind of lowers our kind of our brain. So we're not thinking about everything. We kind of just be in the present. And I think that can just... I think just really sitting with nature and just kind of remembering that this is this is what matters and without this then we haven't got much of a future ahead so take time to spend time in it and take time to appreciate it and take time to shout about it fantastic thank you Kat. and, a, and a, a great vision for all of us for where we want to get to at the weekend i um i think if we don't get there before um thank you uh to um all of our speakers, uh, to uh, Claire, to Ali, to Andy, and to uh, Jenny for a really stimulating session. Thank you to all of you for your challenging and interesting questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. I'm sure our discussion we could have gone on for um, a, another hour at least. Uh, but thank you very much and look forward to seeing you at the next Petroc Talks. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.